Are you ready to dive into the heart-pounding world of sports betting? Look no further than from gridiron to goalposts, the transatlantic sports betting podcast. Join us on a thrilling journey as we navigate the highs and lows of sports betting, bringing you expert insights, game-changing strategies, and the hottest picks from both sides of the Atlantic. Whether you're a seasoned better or just starting out, our hosts will break down the odds, analyze matchups, and share their insider knowledge that'll have you feeling like a true sports guru. So, whether you're into football, soccer, basketball, or any sport that gets your heart racing, tune in to From Gridiron to Goalposts every week for your dose of betting brilliance. Get your game face on and subscribe now on your favorite podcast platform. From Gridiron to Goalposts, the transatlantic sports betting podcast. Bet smart, bet informed. Hey guys, welcome to episode three of From Gridiron to Goalposts, the official sports betting podcast of the NGBN Men's Network. I am your host, Charles Wallace, and we are going to be here every week to uh, give you some insight into picks from soccer to football. We're going to mix in some uh, MMA fights, maybe some boxing matches here and there. Um, but yeah, this is episode three, and we will get started with a recap of of week two, where we ended up overall going seven and six. Now, if you only watch us on YouTube, you might be a little confused by that. We gave six picks out on YouTube last week, and those picks didn't do so hot. We went two and four in those. Um, but as I said last week, I wanted to direct you guys to our Twitter page where we will be posting more plays. And once we start to generate more followers there, we may even um, be able to start posting daily plays on there. But Sunday morning, we did post our NFL card. I kept the entire NFL card to myself, posted it for you guys on the Twitter page on Sunday morning. And that ended up going five and two. We crushed it. And that brought us for the week to seven and six, uh, brought us to a profitable week. So I'm going to point here again, we're going to pump that Twitter. Go follow the Twitter if you haven't already. Another thing I want to talk about before we get into this week's picks, and we do have a good bit of them for you, but I want to talk about getting these bets placed early. Get them placed before an hour prior to kick off of these games because uh, we've had 21 picks that we've tracked so far between the two weeks on this show. And we have beaten the closing line price on 12 out of those 21 picks. So that's a 61.9% rate that I'm giving you a better price on the line than you'll be able to get an hour prior to kickoff. I understand some people, they just want to wait until the day of. I used to be like that as well, but... I can't promise that every week on this show we're going to be profitable, but what I can promise is if you're getting a better closing, if you're getting a better price than the closing line, 60% of the time, that's a recipe for success. Because if we're beating the closing price, so for example, if you have under 47 and a half, like we gave out for the uh, Browns and Bengals on Sunday, that line closed at under 46. So we beat the closing line price by one and a half points there. If we can consistently do that, which we're trying to show you that we can, over the long haul, you're going to be profitable. It's just math. With that being said, I won't keep you guys waiting any longer. We're going to get into some picks. So we're going to start with soccer this week. Soccer, back from the international break. I'm very happy about this. We're going to start in the Bundesliga RB Leipzig and FC Augsburg over three and a half goals coming in at minus 105. Now, Augsburg's matches so far this campaign are averaging 5.3 goals per game, and Leipzig's matches are not far behind, averaging 4.6 goals per game. Um, in each team has played three games so far. Across those three games, both teams to score has hit five times. So I think. We could see Leipzig hop out early here to a lead and Augsburg. They're going to give up a lot of chances, but they've shown that they can generate chances of their own as well. I think Leipzig probably takes this one three, one wouldn't shock me if we saw four, one, but I think the safest bet here rather than going on a Leipzig spread is to just go on the over three and a half goals. 
keeping it moving. We're going to stay in the Bundesliga, and we are going to target another over. Mines versus Stuttgart over two and a half. This is coming in right now at minus 136. Now, Stuttgart matches, just like Augsburg's matches, have been goal fest. 5.3 goals per game to start the campaign out. Uh, Mines matches not too far behind, 3.6 goals per game, and the over two and a half. Now, not both teams to score over two and a half goals, which is what we're targeting here, is five and one in these teams' matches so far. Um, Mines, they haven't, they have yet to keep a clean sheet. Flip side, Stuttgart has yet not to score. So Stuttgart, you have a team that scores every match. Mines, you have a team that has conceded every match so far. And I honestly thought that with the way these teams have been performing, that the line was going to be three and a half. So when I saw this at two and a half, I had to jump all over it. And I do think it's going to steadily move when more people start to uh, get a look at the slate of games. So again, like we talked about, get this in early now. Mines and Stuttgart over two and a half goals. I got it at minus 136. I'd feel like you're getting value on it all the way up to minus 150. So keep that in mind when you're looking, but I think we're in for a pretty exciting clash here. We're going to hop on over to England for our last pick of this soccer slate, where we are going to be targeting Manchester City, as much as it pains me to do, minus one and a half goals against West Ham. Now, West Ham has three wins on the season so far in four games, but they have lost the expected goals battle in two of those games. So there has been a little bit of luck on their side. Um, for anyone who doesn't know expected goals, it's just the, it's a formula. It calculates the number of shots, the quality of the shots, and it adds up to a number that's your expected goals tally for a game. They've won three times uh, and they've drawn once, but they've lost the XG battle in two out of their four games so far. And they have not played a team as good as uh, Manchester City, which at this point in time, it's impossible to play a team as good as them. Again, pains me to say it, but it's true. Um, City is also rounding into form. They kind of got out of the gate a little bit sluggish, but right before the international break, they put Fulham to the sword with a 5-1 win. And this Pep Guardiola's City teams, they tend to have these patches where they are just running through the league. It doesn't matter who you put in front of them. They are scoring three or four. They're giving up zero or one. And I think they're in prime position right now, coming back from the international break. They're going to keep that momentum rolling here against West Ham. Another thing, this is a game that, preseason you wouldn't have thought but this is a battle between number one and number two in the standings right now so it's a bit of an unexpected chance but a chance nonetheless for city to make a statement on another team at the top of the table and they tend to thrive in these spots plus we're getting them at plus 125 to cover this at minus one and a half i think city takes this one three or four nothing if i'm being completely honest we're going to move ahead now to college football. We're going to start off with a service academy game. Now, if you've watched the show and I bring up a service academy, or if you know me and I bring up a service academy, you know where we're going with this. It is Utah State and Air Force under 47 points at minus 110 odds. Now, Air Force is only averaging 57 plays per game. So, when you think about that, they're running less than two plays per minute. And in both of their games so far this year, they have only thrown the ball three times in each of those games. So they are going to be running the ball constantly. This isn't even like Army where we took Army and they try to mix in some wrinkles of throwing. Air Force, this team, they don't care. They are going to run the ball 98% of the time. They don't care that you know it. They're just going to do it. With the new clock rules, it's going to be a game with limited possessions in it, and I just don't see how they are going to eclipse almost 50 points. Um, also, when you talk about Utah State's defense, this isn't just about the Air Force running the ball. Utah State's defense has only given up 2.9 yards per carry this year. So they can be beaten through the air, but they're playing a team that doesn't have the ability or the desire to beat them through the air. 
Air Force has also only given up 10 points in their first two games. Um, This is going to be a rock fight. I think this is going to be a very ugly game to watch, but if you're someone who has the under, it's going to be a a stress-free game. I think this, this doesn't eclipse 40. I think we get this one with a couple possessions to spare. With that being said, on Saturday, we're going to flip the script and we're going to hit an over in Florida State versus Boston College. Now, I'm very high on Florida State this year, as you know, if you've watched the program. Um, I think they have one of the best offenses in college football. Jordan Travis is going to be a leading candidate for the Heisman, in my opinion. And they're playing a Boston College team that is giving up 27 and a half points per game to much lesser opposition. They gave up uh, 28 just this past weekend against Holy Cross. No offense to Holy Cross, but uh, they're nowhere near the caliber of Florida State. Now, Florida State, eighth in yards per game nationally, second in points per game nationally. And what gets this really over the number for me, though, is Boston College's offense is not horrible. This isn't a team that's inept on the offensive side of the ball. They themselves are averaging 27 and a half points per game. So I think this is a spread. It was almost a four touchdown spread when I um, looked at it. I don't know if Florida state can cover that. I think by taking the over here in a game where Florida state should score 35 to 40 points, we give ourselves a, a lot of cover here with a Boston college offense that while not on the level of Florida State, is still nothing to sneeze at. Staying in college, though, you know I'm going to finish it up with another under. Western Kentucky and Ohio State at under 64 and a half. That's minus 118 right now. Now, Ohio State has been known uh, recently for explosive offense. And while I still think they have the capability to be an explosive offense, they haven't shown it yet this year. They have been very stout on the defensive side of the ball. Western Kentucky, they have been able to score the ball um, in games this year. Again, haven't played a team like Ohio State yet, though. And 64 and a half is just a a ton of points um, in any game where you have two evenly matched teams. It's a lot of points. This is a game where Western Kentucky against this Ohio State defense, I just don't see them being able to, you know, carry their weight to get this to the over. And the Ohio State offense, they scored 23 and 35 points so far this year. They haven't clicked yet. Not that they won't click. I just, until they click, I'm not going to be taking a total where you need to get almost 70 points. And, You got to think about this when it comes to a matchup that is this lopsided. If it's a blowout in the second half, the fourth quarter, you could see them just kind of both teams just kind of, okay, hand the ball off, run it up the gut, hand the ball off, run it up the gut. If it gets out of hand, both teams, I think, are going to be content to just get out of there. Too many points. I'm not taking an Ohio State uh, team to carry this much weight four and over when I just haven't seen this iteration of them capable of putting up the points required. We're going to wrap up this week with our NFL slate. I'm going to give you the entire NFL slate this week. Don't forget, we went five and two on them last week. So if you tailed just the NFL plays last week, you could get your missus something nice. You could get your girlfriend something nice. Keep them both out of your hair while you talk to the love of your life. And what's better than that? We're going to start with Thursday night football. We're not on a side here. We are on a player prop. TJ Hawkinson over four and a half receptions at minus 122. I cannot believe that they gave this number out at this price. Please, if you don't take any other plays seriously in terms of getting them in early, get this one in early. He got 20% of the target share last week against Tampa Bay. Um, So Justin Jefferson, he eats up, you know, a lot of the targets, but TJ Hawkinson on that offense is second in command when it comes to getting targeted. He had nine targets last week for eight receptions. They're going up against an Eagles secondary that allowed 
eight receptions on nine targets to uh, Patriots tight ends in week one. So I think the game script is also going to lend to him hitting his over here. The Eagles are the better team in this matchup. Uh, all signs point to them having a lead, the Vikings being behind and needing to throw the ball. Eagles do have a pretty potent pass rush. So with that being said, it's going to be harder for them to have long developing routes down the field. There's going to have to be a lot of short dink and dunks over the middle, a couple of five yard out routes here and there. I do think that this is a number that is going to shoot up a lot. I think by the time this closes, it'll probably be around five and a half receptions. Or if you still have four and a half receptions, you're going to be paying a lot of juice on it, like minus 170, minus 180. You got to get this in now. TJ Hawkinson over four and a half receptions at minus 122. I would take this up to minus 150, minus 155. Sunday now for our next four, we got four more NFL picks. Uh, First off, we are going to Detroit. We are not targeting the Lions. I loved the Lions last week. Don't love them as much here. Seattle plus six at minus 110 is the play for me. Now, in the past 10 years, teams that have lost week one by double digits are bouncing back to cover the spread at a 63% clip in week two. Seattle fits that billing. They were six-point favorites at home against the Rams, and they got throttled 31-13. to The Lions had a huge upset win over the defending champions in Kansas City, and that has caused this line to move two and a half points already to plus six. I think it could, I don't know if it'll move to six and a half. That's a key number. If it moves to plus six and a half, I'll double down and take it again. I like it at plus six. This is purely betting a trend here. I do think the Lions are going to be a good team this year. However, I think the Seahawks, that second half was just really bad from them. I don't think that was a great showing of the type of team they can be. So I'm going to trust the data here. I'm going to trust the trend and take the Seahawks plus six, possibly, oh, sorry, possibly even to get back on track, just ate dinner before this. <laughs> uh, moving ahead, though, we're going to hit Indianapolis money line minus 120 against Houston. Now, These are two teams that I don't think neither of them are going to be very good, but this is more a fade of CJ Stroud than anything. Um, Him and Richardson, the rookie quarterback for the Colts, they had similar numbers in week one. Uh, I was bouncing back and forth between a few games, got to watch both of them on a few drives. I just liked what I saw from Richardson more. And I also think that he has, in this matchup, a little bit more help than we're going to see Stroud get. Um, So this is one where we're just purely fading who I think is going to be, maybe not for their full career, but at least right now, I think the worst quarterback. I know Richardson did exit uh, week one's game in the final minute with an injury. He's questionable right now. But the backup is Gardner Minshew. If Gardner Minshew plays, I actually like them even more to win this one. Uh, Again, not that Minshew's a great quarterback, but the thing with Richardson that worries me is decision-making and turnovers. I trust Minshew more not to turn the ball over. And in a matchup where I already think more highly of the Indianapolis Colts roster, I'm going to take the... uh, Take the risk here at minus 120 on the money line. I think that it'll be possibly even better for this week for us if Minshew plays. But if Richardson plays, I think he's a more dynamic playmaker and he'll make just one, two more plays and get us over the line here. Moving ahead, we have New York Giants minus four and a half at minus 110 versus Arizona. I know this one might be a tough pill to swallow for anyone who uh, laid their eyes on Sunday night football this past week, but this is the same trend that I touched on earlier with the Seahawks. Uh, Teams that lose double digits week one cover at a 63% rate in the past 10 years in week two. And they are playing a Cardinals team that I was severely unimpressed with. Okay. I was extremely 
low on the Cardinals coming into this year. And I know they covered the spread in week one against Washington, but I'm no higher on them now than I was coming into the year. They won the turnover battle, which is major. They had a defensive touchdown and they still lost the game by four. So I think you're playing a Giants team that I rate higher than I than I rate the Washington Commanders. And they are coming off of an embarrassing game. These are professional athletes. They're very prideful. If you think that the Giants are going to come out here and let this one be close, I I don't say it. I think that they're going to run away with this one. They want to put that Dallas game behind them and get back on track. 40 to nothing is not indicative of any gap in any between any NFL teams, much less a Giants team that I think is going to be an eight, nine win team this year. That was just a snowball game. One bad thing happened. Another bad thing happened and things got out of hand fast. If you've ever played sports, you've been on the receiving end of a snowball game before you've been on the giving end of a snowball game before. It's one of those situations where you honestly just have to crumple it up, throw it all away, and get ready for the next week because it's just not indicative of the skill level that you have. I think we're seeing an overreaction to the market here due to that 40 to nothing score line. I think this will close closer to minus six for the Giants, and I would still like it there. All right, moving ahead. Let me turn my page here. And our last pick of the week, We are going to Carolina for Monday night football saints versus Panthers. And we like under 40 and a half points for this game. Neither of these offenses looked even playable. Like neither of these offenses looked like NFL offenses in week one. Now I know it's week one, right? There's kinks to be worked out. It's not indicative of, the potential that a team has throughout the year, but I'm also very high on the new Orleans saints defense. These teams combined for two touchdowns in week one. And that's really just, I mean, it's not something that I can discount here when I'm looking at this total, when I'm looking at these teams, I just don't see how they're going to get, over 40 points, how they're going to get to, let's say, a 21-20, you know, to get over the line here. Also, uh, Panthers rookie quarterback Bryce Young, he did have a bit of a turnover problem in, in week one. So I think that the coaching staff there is going to look to take a little bit of the pressure off of him, lean more on the run game, not give him as many opportunities to throw them out of the game as he kind of did in week one against Atlanta. So I think they're going to try to maybe take the air out of the ball a little bit, make this a lower scoring affair. That will give them the best chance to get over the line here and get an upset win uh, at home in prime time. Also, these are divisional opponents. I know there's roster turnover year over year, but these teams play twice a year. Their last five matchups have gone under this number. When these teams match up, things tend to get cagey. I think now with a rookie quarterback in Carolina who turned the ball over in some critical spots in week one, we're going to see a lot of ground game from Carolina. And I don't think they're going to be able to move this ball very well against New Orleans. On the flip side, I don't think Derek Carr is as bad as people make him out to be. But I also don't think that this is a Saints team that's going to be able to carry the load and let's say get 27, 28 points in this game. I just don't. I think this is going to be a game in the high 20s, low 30s. I think we're not going to have any trouble here going under 40 and a half points. All right, that'll do it. With that being said, we are going to wrap this episode here. We had just 11 picks for you guys, and we may even be dropping some more on the Twitter as the weekend goes on. We're going to be monitoring those lines, seeing what we can get, all right? If we can get any better value out there, we're going to look to get it. So please follow the Twitter. We're going to be looking to drop more plays there. However, if you're not following the Twitter, if no one's there to see it, you know, what's it's hard to be dropping the plays. We can't help you guys as much. So please Follow that Twitter right there. We're going to put it in. Follow us there. 
We're going to consistently be dropping plays for you guys. And with that being said, uh, be smart, have fun, and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you.